That's dangerous when we allow things from the enemy to be willingly allowed into our house. been a couple of weeks since we were together. Uh, last time we were doing our study here, we had started chapter 19 and didn't get through it. So tonight we'll pick up where we left off. You might remember Saul uh, doesn't like David very much. <laughs> uh, he has a problem with David and he wants to shish kebab David, it would appear, right? So we saw where he had thrown his spear at him and he's just, you know, Saul's got multi-personality distress or something, I don't know. But uh, anyway, we did see in verse 10 of chapter 19 that Saul tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. But David slipped away from his presence. And he drove the spear into the wall. And so David fled and he escaped that night. That's where we ended. Verse 11, so Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him. And to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal, Michal, however you say that word, let David down through a window. Interesting. And he went and he fled and he escaped. And she took an image and she laid it in the bed. And she put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, bring him to me in the bed that I might kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was an image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And she answered Saul and said, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So, interesting. A couple of things here as uh, we get started. Um, he is laying wait for David. Now, you know, a lot of times in, our, in this study, as we're looking at Saul and we're looking at David, um, you can kind of look at Saul as the adversary, you can look at Saul as the enemy. And, and, you know, Paul in the New Testament, he tells us that our adversary can portray himself to be an angel of light. So on one hand, he can look very good, he can look very harmless, but yet, on the other hand, he can be deadly. And we see this very same personality traits, if you will, in Saul and in his life. And so David, being the... Uh, the future king of the Jews, well, he's already the king, but hasn't taken the throne yet. But we do know that it was through David's lineage that Jesus was born and uh, that the Messiah came, which was promised to him. And so we can kind of look at David as, you know, the, the, the godly side, and we kind of look at Saul as the evil side. And there he is, sending his minions out, if you will, uh, to lie in wait for him. Now, evidently his wife really cares a lot about him. I think she sees maybe, maybe she's got another agenda. I'm not sure. Maybe she knows that uh, David is eventually going to be king, which would make her the queen. Maybe she's looking forward, you know, maybe she's thinking ahead, thinking, you know, I need to preserve his life, I need to look out for him. And so she does, and she warns him. And uh, I kind of like what she said in verse 11. She said, if you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you're going to be dead. You know, tomorrow you'll be killed. So you got to do something right now. Um, it's interesting how um, he is lowered down through a window. I look at that and I think that's kind of humiliating in a sense. It almost seems cowardly in a sense. 
It almost seems like they're trying to grasp straws in the flesh and using their own idea maybe here to try to help David. And so she lowers him down. And in verse 13, it's also very interesting that she takes an image. Now, what is that? It's an idol. It was an idol. That's exactly what. So here's what we're seeing. In David's house, there were idols. In David's house, there were false gods. And his wife was worshiping these false gods. But she's a Jew. And she has no business worshiping false gods. Where'd they come from? Where'd the false gods come from? They came from their neighbors. They came from the neighboring nations. They came from the people that are around them. And there was a lot of peer pressure for them to allow these things into their homes. Matter of fact, we see uh, as far as the nation itself is concerned that Many times the men would go down into the Philistine cities to look for a woman. Because, you know, basically the, the Jewish gals, they didn't wear a lot of makeup. They didn't get all fancied up and everything. They didn't have all the, you know, array of things that some of these other uh, cultures would have. Some of these other nations, Philistine nations. And the men were attracted to that. And so many, many times they would go and they'd find a woman there and they would marry her and bring her home into Israel. And along with her would come her customs and her false gods and her religion and it would be pulled right into the house. That's dangerous when we allow things from the enemy to be willingly allowed into our house. To have idols in our house, so to speak. Not in our physical homes, but I'm talking about in our lives, in our hearts. And I think that a lot of people today, they may not want to put it in quotations or they may not want to categorize it, but they're worshiping a false god. Whatever they might be doing, whatever they're into, you know, it's, it's a false god. And, and, and God warns them over and over and over again, don't let this happen. It's going to pollute your house. So as much as his wife, it appears, is looking out for his best interest here, I kind of think she has some ulterior motives going on here. And she comes up with this brilliant idea to take one of the idols in their home and put it in the bed and make it look like David's laying there on the bed. And of course, Saul is so desperate. He says, I don't care if he's sick or not. Bring him here in his bed. I'll kill him in his bed. That's how desperate Saul is to extinguish David, if you will. To get David out of his way. Now, as we continue to learn about David and Saul and, and, and all the history there that took place, we're going to find out that ultimately, the man of God is victorious. Ultimately, the enemy is destroyed. And I think that that's reflective of our relationship with the Lord today, too. It may seem as we look around that maybe we might feel a little defeated. It might seem as we look around that something's, you know, are we really winning? But in the end, yeah, we do. We win. In the end, he wins. He has, and you know, here's the thing. It's already a done deal. It's already been spoken. It's already been paid for. We have already won. It's just a matter of turning the pages of time until it fulfills itself. And we're actually experiencing that ultimate uh, victory in the Lord over Satan in our lives. So David gets away. In verse 18, he fled and he escaped. And he went to Samuel at Ramah and he told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and they stayed at Naoth. Naoth. So it was told Saul, saying, Take note, for your information, king, David's in Naoth, Naoth in Ramah. So there's a little informant here going on, trying to Maybe get some extra points with the king. So Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying 
And Samuel, standing as the leader over them, the Spirit of God came over those messengers of Saul, and they started prophesying. So what were they prophesying? I think they were prophesying good things about David and bad things about Saul. They were probably prophesying the exact thing that Saul didn't want them saying. And this place where David is right now, it's kind of like the seminary, if you will, of prophets. It's like the, a pastor's college or something like that because, you know, he's got all these students there. And there's a whole group of them. And Samuel's the leader. He's the teacher. He's the instructor. And these men come to take David. And the next thing they know, they're saying wonderful things about David. It amazes me how God can just have so much power and so much authority that he can cause these men to prophesy and to say the very things that they could lose their life for saying if they were back in the king's house and said something like that. So Saul was told in verse 21 about it, and he sent new messengers, different messengers, and the very same thing happened. And Saul sent messengers again a third time, and they also prophesied. Now you got all these messengers of the king in this one place, and they're all talking about David and, and God and the goodness of God and the victory and who David is and what God's plan was. And so then he also went to Ramah, and he came to the great well that was at Sikshu. So he asked, and he said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at the Naioth in Ramah. And so he went there to Naioth, Naioth in Ramah. And the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went in and on and prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah. So now even the king himself is speaking. This, the spirit has come upon him and he's prophesying these things. It says in verse 24 something interesting. He stripped off all of his clothes and he prophesied before Samuel in like manner. And he lay down naked all that day and all that night. And therefore, they say, is Saul among the prophets? Well, absolutely not. He's not among the prophets. God is using, God is having his way with Saul. God is in charge of this man, even though this man doesn't realize it. God is in charge with our enemy, even though sometimes we don't realize it. And look what Saul does. This is amazing to me. He takes all of his clothes off, lays on the ground, and he's prophesying all day and all night. So I would imagine while he's laying there naked, prophesying all day and all night, David gets a heads up about it, and he decides to take off. So in chapter 20, it says David fled from there in Ramah, and he went and he said to Jonathan, now remember, Jonathan is Saul's son. David and Jonathan are very tight. They have a great relationship together, and uh, Jonathan is well aware that David is the promised king. Jonathan is well aware that his father has been removed by God from that office, but yet he's still sitting on the throne. We call that usurping the throne, you know? Now, in the New Testament, when we get to the New Testament, Paul tells us very clearly that Satan is the god of this world. That Satan truly has kind of a throne over this world. He has control over the world. I've often thought to myself about us uh, human beings, why it is that we can't just live together. Why we can't just live in peace. Why does there have to be war all the time? Why do we have to invent reasons to bring misery to other people. And I think it's because, first of all, we have this sinful nature, and secondly, Satan has usurped the throne of this earth. 
He's sitting on a throne that really doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Jesus. You can go all the way back to Genesis. And you can see where it tells us in Genesis that there's going to come a day when Jesus is going to have his foot on the neck of this enemy. He's going to destroy him once and for all, and then he will take the throne that is rightly his. But for the time being, it's obvious as we look around and see what's going on in our world and what's always gone on in our world, violence, hatred, murder, war, covetousness. It's been that way since the very, very beginning when, when Cain killed his brother. It, that was just a precursor of what all of history was going to be like. As long as that serpent was sitting on a throne that doesn't belong to him. How hard is it for you and me to sit back and see this and understand what's going on and then just be able to say, well, Lord, we trust you. We know that you're in charge. We know that you have a plan, and we're just going to rest in that, and we're going to do what we can do to do good and be obedient to you, knowing that there's going to come a day when it's all going to change. I have a hard time with that, I'll be honest with you. I want to act. I want to move. I want to do something. But those things that I think that I want to do, they're not godly things. They're not things that God is saying, all right, Tom, I want you to go out and do this. I want you to go out and do that. I think we're doing exactly what God wants us to do right now. It's being together, praying, studying his word, being encouraged and being reminded that God is on that throne in heaven and he is in charge. And Jesus is standing at his right hand. Oh, this hand. His right hand. I'm left-handed, so you got to give me a break. Um, but the right hand is always the side of authority. That's what that is for. The left hand isn't. It's the right hand that, that speaks of authority. So here's Jesus at the right hand of the Father with all authority. And sometimes I think we look at it and we think to ourselves, really, I, it, it just doesn't seem like uh, there's a whole lot going the direction that we would like to see things go. But we have promises. We have stories like this in the Old Testament that remind us, as bad as it might look, God is still in control. Jonathan is a very wise man. Jonathan sees that in David. And so David goes to Jonathan and he's like, what have I done to make your dad so mad at me? He says, what have I done? What's my sin? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? It's a really good question. What is our sin that the world hates us so much for because of who we are? They hate us. They would extinguish our voices completely if they could. They're trying. But what have we done? What have I done, he says. Jonathan said to him in verse 2, By no means you shall not die. You notice he, he really didn't really answer the question. Jonathan said, by no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? Is it not so? And then David took an oath again and said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Boy, talk about having a life of anxiety, right? Talk about not knowing what's going to happen the very next minute. You know, the humanity of David is coming out here. I realize I could be killed at any moment. Is that okay for us to allow our humanity to come out like that sometimes? I think so. It's just being honest. 
It's being real. You know, Jesus let his humanity come out. Do you remember when he was in the garden? What did he pray for? He prayed that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. I believe that was his humanity crying out. Father, if there's a plan B, let's institute it right now. And then his spirit, his spirit responds by saying, but nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. That's very interesting coming from the Lord himself. It shows that he was human, just like we are, just like David was. So Jonathan said in verse 4 to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. Jonathan is more loyal to David than he is his own father. And here's the thing. Jonathan would be king. When Samuel's gone, Jonathan would have been the heir to the throne. But he puts that aside. He sets that aside because he knows that David is the one that God chose. And so David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is the new moon. And I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. But let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day in the evening. So evidently this new moon, there was a tradition. They'd all get together with the king and they'd have this big feast and celebrate the new moon. Well, you know, I kind of look at that and I think, wow, there's another uh, instance of weird religious practices creeping in to the throne. A new moon. You notice the words are capitalized. That I should not fail to sit with the king, but let me go. Let me go. Let me hide. And if your father misses me at all, then say to him, David earnestly ask permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city. For there's a yearly sacrifice there for all of the family. Talk about trying to use human methods to protect ourselves from our adversary, this is a good example of it. He's asking Jonathan to lie. Just tell your dad I'm in Bethlehem. I'll be hiding out in the field, but if he asks, tell him I had to go to Bethlehem for a yearly sacrifice with my family. And if he says it is well, then your servant will be safe. But if he's very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. This is kind of throwing out the, flo- the, the, the fleece, if you will. If this happens, then that means this. And if this happens, then that means this is going to happen. You ever do that with the Lord? A lot of people do that. Give me a sign, Lord. Verse 8, therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant. For you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there's iniquity in me, kill me yourself. Why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, far be it from you. For if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? And David said to Jonathan, who will tell me or what if or what if your father answers you roughly? So Jonathan said to David, come on, let's go out into the field. So both of them go out into the field. This is where David plans on camping out for three days while they're having this new moon uh, celebration thing. And Jonathan says to David in verse 12, The Lord God of Israel is a witness. And when I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or on the third day, and indeed there is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you. And I will send you away, that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you, as he has been with my father. Has been, past tense, over with. Aren't you glad that 
We can blow it. We can stumble. We can fall. We can rebel. And the Lord is still waiting for us. The Lord is still willing to accept us. He'll never forsake us. Even when we're not doing so good. So that the Lord might be with you, David, like he used to be with my father. You know, in the beginning, Saul did have a good start. It didn't take long, though, for his true heart to be revealed. You can, you can fool the people, but you can't fool God, right? You can put on the act, but God can see right through it. That's why it's so important that when we come before the Lord, we come with a pure heart. Verse 14, and you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die. But you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies from David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow. Because he loved him. He loved him as he loved his own soul. And Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow's the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone of Izel. And then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I was shooting at a target. And there I will send the lad, saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them and come. Well, then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you, go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. So they've come up with this plan, ingenious plan, to communicate with each other from a distance. So that David can kind of be hiding out, observing what's going on, and Jonathan will be able to give him a message of how dad responded to David's uh, not being there. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He's unclean. Surely he's unclean. He has done something sinful And he can't come to this uh, celebration because he's unclean. But it happened on the next day, on the second day of the month, David's place was empty. Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, neither yesterday or today? So Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked for permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go, for our family has a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. So, first thing is that Saul thinks that maybe David... He's unclean, he's done something that he shouldn't have done, and maybe perhaps he's, you know, covered in ash, and he's repenting, and he's praying, and he's trying to get himself right with God. It seems like Saul was not too irate about that. But the idea that he would choose his family over the king, the idea that he would listen to his brother, supposedly, to go to Bethlehem, over being in his place in the king's house. And the other thing I think that made Saul angry here was the fact that Jonathan spoke for the king. David made the request of Jonathan. And Jonathan said, okay, go. 
So verse 30, Saul's anger is aroused against his son, Jonathan. He said, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. <laughs> okay, dads, don't blame it on your wife. <laughs> Do I not know? This is, this is the clincher. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? Man, this guy's vile. You know, you know how James talks about our tongue, how we can start a fire with our tongue and burn down the whole forest with, with our words? Saul's pretty good at that, isn't he? These are shameful things that he's saying. Verse 31, for as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. It didn't go the way they had hoped that it was going to go. And Saul's reminding his son, hey, as long as this guy's around, you'll never be king. Well, he already knew that. He already accepted that. He already embraced that idea. So Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and he said to him, why should he be killed? What has he done? So Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, his own son, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger, and he ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David, because his father had treated him shamefully. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. You can almost kind of see a picture of them going out there together. And he says to the, his lad, now run and find the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, he cried out after the lad and he said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried after the, out to the lad and said, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and he came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of this matter. And then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go and carry them to the city. <coughs> Excuse me. And as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground, and he bowed down three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace. Since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. And so he arose and he departed. And Jonathan went into the city. This would be the last time they see each other. Be the last time David sees him alive. Jonathan will die on the battlefield. Along with his father. The man was faithful to the end. He stood his ground. You know, we, we read a few verses back that Jonathan was angry with his father. He was furious. Verse 34, he arose from the table in fierce anger. You've got to kind of wonder if his dad had ever seen him actually behave like that. I think Jonathan was the kind of guy that was very willing to submit to authority. 
I think he was the kind of guy that really had other people's best interests at heart. And maybe even we could look at Jonathan and say, you know, in a sense, he's kind of like the Holy Spirit. He was there. He was protecting David. He was giving David knowledge. And you got to kind of wonder. You know, you see God working in these different ways through these men. And you know what's really crazy about it? I don't think any of them really realized what was really going on. I think that they were just caught up in the situation. They were caught up in what was going on visually. But they really couldn't see the spiritual aspect. They really couldn't see the shadows of all of this. And where it pointed. And what it was saying. I think it's interesting in verse 42. Jonathan says to David, go in peace. We've made an agreement together. May the Lord be between you and me. And not only between you and me, but between your descendants and my descendants forever. This should become a tradition. This should become a family thing where your kids love my kids. Forever. Doesn't God work in mysterious ways? Isn't it amazing how he does things? Sometimes we look at it and we think, now why, why is this happening? Why is God allowing this in my life? Why am I going through this difficulty in my life? Sometimes I feel as though God's not even paying attention. Or maybe I've made him angry at me and he's put a curse on me. I'm inclined to think that our God is a very good father. And he has his children's best interest in mind. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about the discipline of the Lord. And he's basically saying in Hebrews that, you know, if God disciplines you, if he paddles your hiney, it's just proof that you're his son. Because that's what a good father does. He disciplines his children. I kind of wonder what, what David's going through here. Now, wait a minute. It wasn't, very, it wasn't very long ago, Lord, that Samuel was pouring oil over my head. He was pronouncing me to be the king over Israel. And now look at me. I'm hiding in bushes. I'm running for my life. What are you doing, Lord? And David, we're going to find out next week, he doesn't really respond in a very spiritually mature manner. As a matter of fact, he totally takes the, the dilemma that he's in and he embraces it in his own imagination, his own power, his own idea, and he comes up with a plan. And I think in a way, what we're going to see next week is he really kind of disrespects God by how he handled this. But eventually, in our lives, yes, we do make mistakes. Yes, we do handle things perhaps in a fleshly manner when God would rather have us just trust him and be patient. Be busy. Be about the Lord's business. Be in the Word. Letting the Holy Spirit show us ourselves in the Word. We can learn so much from these stories of how these men respond and, and, and how their heart is and what their attitude is and this struggle that's going on. You know, all down through history... Those who are in power have always feared losing power. 
even to the point where they would kill their own blood to keep power. We see that. All the way up to the time of Christ, we see that. Where Herod was so threatened by the birth of a little child that he went out and slaughtered all those babies to protect his throne. He killed his brothers. He killed his family members because he thought that they were a threat. Sometimes power isn't so awesome. Sometimes power can be our downfall. Maybe that's why the Lord allows things to come across our path that humble us. That make us desperate. You know, we used to sing this song here, I'm desperate for you. I think that's a heart, an attitude that we shouldn't let go of. We should be desperate for the Lord as though he's our every breath. And when we're desperate for God and our hearts are humble, then we're going to be more apt to let him have his way. We're going to be more apt to step out of that boat onto the waves and onto the end of the storm. Trusting him. That he won't let us sink. He won't let us perish. It amazes me that, you know, that, that story in the New Testament where he's out there with those guys, with the guys, and, and this storm comes up. And, uh, you know, the first time when we studied a couple of weeks ago, he just calms the water. He just says, calm. And it just all becomes peaceful in a moment. He has control over the very powers of nature. And then, of course, there's that other time when they're out on their boat. And you kind of wonder, you know, Jesus tried to teach them a lesson when they were all in the boat with him, and he calmed the storm. And now they're out in the boat by themselves. And they're freaking out. They think they're going to drown. They think they're going to perish. Yeah. And they look over, and they're... There's the Lord walking out on the water towards them. <laughs> and they thought he was a ghost. It's so shallow, isn't it? Sometimes people can be, we sometimes can be so shallow in the way we view these things. But there's a lot of depth here. A lot of depth here in David's life as God is molding him not only through David's victories in the battlefield, but he's molding him through his failures also. He molded Peter through his failures. Maybe sometimes he's molding us through our failures. To truly become desperate for the Lord. Nothing else matters. I don't care about the waves. I don't care about the fire. I don't care about it's burning down. I don't care. I'm going to trust in the Lord. You know, later on, David would cry out, what is my life? Who am I, God, that you would care about me? I mean, I'm just this little human being. I'm, I'm here for the blink of an eye in, in history, I'm just here and gone that quick, and yet you care about me like that? Was it in the first John? John said, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. He's saying, I want you to check it out. I want you to take a good look at what kind of love the Father has given unto us. And what is it? You, me, that we could be called sons of God. Insignificant little humans, here one day and gone the next, but yet we can be called 
the sons of God. I think when you're out there in the world and it's kicking you around and it's kind of telling you that you really don't matter, it's kind of telling you that if you took your last breath today, tomorrow the sun would come up and everybody would go to work and the world would just continue on. So what is your life? It's a good question. It's not very much, is it? If you don't have the hope of being a son of God. And when I say son, I mean it in a kind of generic turn. Don't want to leave you girls out. Sons and daughters of God. Does that sound better? So we truly are blessed. We are blessed to have God actively working in our lives through our victories, through our failures. Isn't it amazing? Because, you know, your brain, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Every single one of us has this consciousness, this awareness of ourselves. I don't think any other creature on the planet does. You take a dog, and when it sees its reflection, it'll bark at its reflection. Because it doesn't have any sense of self. Like we do. It doesn't have any self-consciousness. And in your brain and in my brain and all of our little brains, all these little, we have our own little universe. We create our own reality in these brains that we have. All of us are sitting here right now and all those electrons are firing and all the thoughts are going through our brains. We are amazing. We're absolutely amazing. So when God created man. He created man in his image with a consciousness, a self-awareness, if you will. And part of that self-awareness is coming to a point in my life where, and your life where we are now aware of our need. We are aware of what we are, who we are. And by God's grace, his mercy, by the blood of Jesus, he makes us into a brand new creature. I love that passage in Corinthians. We're brand new creatures in Christ. It says the old things have passed away. And he said, behold, all things have become new. Wow, that's good news for me. I don't know about you. But I'm really glad that all that stuff has passed I'm really glad I don't have to live there anymore. Because he's molding us and shaping us to be that person that he wants us to be. So, next week, we will continue our story of David and his exploits, if you will. So, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you so much for these uh, verses that we were able to look at tonight. Lord, sometimes when we're reading these things, it's almost like we can envision it in our minds. Almost like it's like a movie or something, Lord, that we can actually uh, uh, see what's happening here. But we know it goes so much deeper than just the surface. We know, Lord, that you're working in David. That you're allowing him to fail, even as much as tell lies. But yet you're not done with him. You continue working in him because he's your man. He's the anointed. What an awesome privilege for David that his lineage would be the Messiah. But Lord, I'm thankful tonight that you're working with us too. That you don't give up on us, Lord, even when we fail you. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the fellowship that we have with you. In Jesus' name, amen.